Welcome to the Christmas edition of Book Lovers Wire Wrapper. I'm Gareth Rapson with co-host Steve Lawrence. Hello, Gareth. And this is your one-hour program about the wonderful world of books. Um, you found us on 92.7 Arrow FM, Channel 41 Freeview TV, and we begin, Steve, mm -hmm. why would, how does it finish this year? Yep. And then I'm also going to ask highlights, but what do you got for me? Uh, well, it has finished. The last um, rendition was about the 7th of December, I think. Um, and that was short and shorter, so kind of short and flash fiction. Uh, Jack and Anthony turned up, having both published those sorts of things, and it was, it was a really engaging session. <laughs> Attendance was a bit disappointing. Um, but Because that's been good all year. Yeah. It's a busy, strange time of the year. Yeah, it is. And I guess maybe it's just a... Everybody's got a lot on. Yeah. yeah. And I guess people don't probably understand flash fiction and what it's about. Um, it's, it's hard to do. Um, it's one of those, you know, the short story, you have to be, make sure every word counts in with a... A 300-word short story, you've really got to focus in. <laughs> the listener runs a little column on flash fiction. Mm. That they give you a little starter, and you've got to basically nail it in a couple of sentences. They're, they're clever as. Mm. There's a lot of clever people around New Zealand who are good at that stuff. And to start the new year next year, you'll have what? Uh, well, nothing till February. Okay, oh, you have a, year's, a, a month's break. Yeah, and I think first up we've got a... German storyteller, I think. I haven't paid much attention. I know. We will hear more. <coughs> retailers about. focus on Christmas. Anything post Christmas is like, yeah. you know, and, the and next we millennium. Will, we'll give everybody a, a full briefing in January, yep. at the end of January. So, um, anyway, 2023. Mm. The. Yeah, and before we get right into the perhaps we're looking back, I'd like to start with a book launch that. Did you go to the book launch no. for number 30? No. Um, Gail went. And um, and had a. It's, she said it was an interesting book launch. Mm. Um, there was that. Yeah, and, and generally you get wine. That's why she. Went. <laughs> yeah, and and um, and then I consequently met Anne mm. um, in Hayden, the the author, um, and I've now got a copy, which you can get at Almos, mm -hmm. um, of of the book um, number thirty, mm. which it's unusual to have a number in a title, um, and. It's the big thing about this. Th this is a wire wrapper book, mm. you know, and it's one of our tales, and we should always celebrate um, our stories. And um, Anne has done as well. It was fun talking to her about it, about the um, the word count, how that you know the publisher um, had to sort of just gently edge it her down. So there was editing, editing, editing um, to get it shorter and shorter and and. I think they've ended up with a terrific little tale, um, perfect for the bedtime story mm. for a little one. Um, and who doesn't like a a story of what we you know see or endlessly around us in the wire wrapper, um, <laughs> our bovine friends? What did you think of the illustrations? Um, truthfully, um, I, I Rosanna thought, Rosanna George. I don't know who that is. I didn't think that was the best illustrated children's book I've ever seen. Yeah, but you see them all. Yes, I you do. have you have a high bar. Yes, um, I I bring my art sort of background onto this, and I kind of like it. Mm. I think actually this is the sort of art a child will absolutely engage with. Um, not too fussy, pretty stark, mm. um, a lot of hard edges, um, but it plays well. It is kind of classically New Zealand. Yeah, um, but we see, when when a book is in a bookshop, people who are thinking about buying, so they don't make allowances for the fact that it's local. They compare it with Axel Scheffler or, you know, John Birningham. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> you know some Mike, Michael Rosen's, you know, let's yeah. go hunt, hunt let's all go, we're all going on a bear hunt. Yeah, yeah so it's... Classics. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's a tough place to... Hang out for a book. Yeah, was Anne's first story mm. in this format, um, first children's book. Though she has published other things, she was telling me. Um, 
good book worth finding in 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 Elmo's mm. terrific table actually of children's books. Um, there's something for the most discerning buyer can find one, and maybe they'll find number thirty if we as we go along. Yeah, well, we divide the the children's section into two parts, equal parts. One is the rest of the world, and then there's New Zealand. Um, so we do pretty well in New Zealand kids' books. Yeah. And although, although they all seem to be about, what's the word, anthropomorphic or something? Like yeah, that's animals who, who can think and speak, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doors who can, yeah, I can, well. What would you say? I don't want to break the, anybody's heart or anything, but, you know, they can't. Right. The... Um, Okay, I'd like to move on to let's just let's just jump to Japan. <laughs> now I want to show you this, which abroad in Japan. Mm. Um, what do you think now? What do you think of that for a cover? Well, that's a very good cover. Yeah, because it's got two things going for it. One is it tells you exactly what the book's about, and secondly, it's visually striking, so you can find it in the bookshop. Yeah. No, I, I thought I, I, this would be in my in my best five of the year of covers we've seen. I think it's fantastic, um, and a, a really interesting book. Um, Chris Broad was a, a teacher. He graduates in England, non-fiction book, and what am I going to do? Somebody talks to him about why don't you go to Japan as an English teacher? So he joins the Jet program where there's like three thousand teachers from around the world, many New Zealanders. Mm -hmm. um, descend and there they have like three days training in Tokyo and then they get assigned throughout Japan and he ends up in a, in a tiny rural northern city town and we get his adventures of adapting you know not never having taught English doesn't speak Japanese um, most of the people he meets don't speak English he goes there the English department is terrified of him because their English is pretty terrible and they don't want them to be to be shown up in fact nobody wants them to be shown up but and the students are kind of like indifferent because who is he hmm. and nobody gets him um, but he starts to kind of youtube it now it's i thought this is a really good book and he he in the in the end he does travel endlessly around japan but because he makes little youtube videos and there are now about 200 of them i thought i'll oh, go and have a look at them they're terrific and I'm just looking at the stats, it's gone, he's the, it's the largest foreign YouTube channel um, abroad in Japan, um, in the world, yeah. and there's, it's, there's two and a half million subscribers, and like there's 4,000 million, four million, 400 million views, and a couple of hundred. And he gets two cents a view or something. Oh, I have it? not, well they have a little advertising strip in it, yeah. so, um, yeah. and, and he's made documentaries, but he's the the BBC go-to guy on Japan, he, he pops up on that, um, TED Talks, and he's always the, in the, the Japan Times, Tokyo's biggest newspaper, he's the guy they go to. Mm. So from his days as an English teacher, he taught himself Japanese, taught himself to read and write it, um, and has these terrific adventures. Totally commend the book, in the first instance, and the, um, the YouTube clips, and it's called Abroad in Japan. Steve, what do you got over there? Well, what I've brought along is just one book in each of the sort of genres that people might be thinking about that's turned up in the last week or so. So You have the best job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where should we start? I guess we should start um, with Prophet Song, which won the Booker. Um, this is a... Uh, this has never happened to me in book selling before. Because when it won the Booker, I got an email from the effectively the Allen and Unwin rep saying, no one's got any stock, no one thought it was going to win, <laughs> we're going to... we're printing this thing and we're going to air freight it and you'll give it on the 11th of December. And I thought, oh yeah. <laughs> Which year? That's right. That's but on the 11th of December, it turned up. The and supply chain kicked in. Well, they gave it a nudge, I think. It yeah. probably spent a lot more money than they would otherwise. But There's a lot of buzz. There was a lot of interest in the book, mm. so it's in their interest. And, um, and the timing, of course, is perfect yeah. for, for Christmas. Yeah, so we've been selling it pretty well. well it, um, the, the interesting thing about it is that like, there's no dialogue as such, and... Um, it is pretty dense, and there are not your typical yeah. paragraph breaks. Each, each paragraph is about 
page and a half. Yeah, which is pretty intense demands on a reader. Mm. Um, people have read, a couple of people who have read it talked to me and said, hey, they liked it, mm. but they said you do adjust to that. It's yeah. a stylistic thing and, um, you know, it's... I think it's the, the it's, hey look it won the big prize. It's a matter of saying what's all the fuss about. So um, you can get it at almost. You can. I just read the synopsis because most people probably don't know what it's about. On a dark, wet evening in Dublin, scientist and mother of four, Eilish Stack, answers her front door to find the GNSB on her step. Two officers from Ireland's newly formed secret police are here to interrogate her husband, a trade unionist. Ireland is falling apart. Country is in the grip of a government turning towards tyranny, and when her husband disappears, Irish finds herself caught within the nightmare logic of a society that's quickly unraveling. Sort of feels 1984-ish. Um, Handmaid's Tale, dystopian. It's um, yeah, but it's the word is it's it's. A good read, and it's um, we, you know, hmm. in the new year, you and I both will know a lot more about it. Well, um, and it's in our book clubs um, program, so right. it's chugging towards me inevitably. Right, a couple of thrillers, and I saw. Well, the first one was um, Year of the Locust, which we we looked at last month, yep. and it got launched, and um, now I had a chance to read it. Which was in a big book. Mm, not as big as I Am Pilgrim, but still 600 odd pages. I know. And um, first person narrative. Mm. And, you know, it, it's in the badlands of Pakistan and Iran and Afghanistan. Um, the attraction, it's like it's, it's, as always, the into the world of spying, and that's kind of really good. Um, and so, spy craft and its border crossings and interrogation and um, surveillance and escaping and shooting, and it, that's it's pretty exciting. A lot of pace, good tension, mm. um, excellent villains. That's what Terry Hayes does. Mm. They're always smarter than smart, um, you know. And and it's got a nice tight finish. The negatives. Um, since he wrote the first one, I Am Pilgrim, there's a lot of people have entered that global thriller market. Yeah. And um, what used to be quite unique with him on that first one, now is we all know a little bit more, and it's, you know, um, it's, you know, Tom Clancy with a sort of, you know, he was into that tech side of the whole thing, mm -hmm. and you, you go back through all those you know, Clive Tussler, Tussler, Chris Ryan, it was all sort the, of... The, there is a lot of it. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people around. And it's got this Terminator situation, you know, where you're coming, people coming out of another time thing, which really will, con you know, perhaps conflict some readers. Hmm. I think you just got to let it go. This is a work of fiction, and it does get build right, gets right back into a terrific finish. Surrender to it. It's a classic um, summer read. And here's a screenwriter, so the tend to be written as though it's he, yeah some of the description yeah. looks like he's you know it's written for the art director and another one which i saw on your on your shelves yeah. um nelson demille with his son alex demille bloodlines latest which is um which i read and i that was a real page turner <laughs> terrific little read and um nelson demille 23 books a lot of them you know, classic thrillers, um, but this is the second one. He had another one, The Deserter, I think, of which this book follows neatly on. And you want you'd want to read them in order, that because there's a lot of mm. references from this mm. to that. Um, the it's a Berlin story, which gets me right away. I do like German and Berlin settings, so I was you know involved in it right away. And it's one of those places I seem to know heaps about and never have been there. <laughs> Do you have any cities like that that you feel like you know but you've never been there? Uh, Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Wellington aside. But anyway, the, the big thing about this is that we always have these terrific protagonists who are kind of anti-authoritarian, but, you know, he works for the army, he's an army investigator, mm. but breaks all the rules. And, of course, that is very, very entertaining as he goes along. Real good book for the for the summer. Yeah, um, I, I, I would and it's nice and meaty. It's not long enough in, in pages you go like this actually is a lot of fun um, And that's going to get it. I think it'd be a terrific terrific summer read Okay, back to your side of the desk uh, Well sticking with the I suppose slightly um, Literary end we have a, a new John Boyne Which is very short 
contrasting nearly every other book that turns up these days. This is only... What have they done here? Put the funny cover on backwards. <laughs> Put the dust jacket on backwards on this one. Um, this is only 165 pages. Uh, it's, it's a bit longer than Claire Keegan's latest books, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm really interested in. Yeah. But the um, and I've read some earlier works by him mm. and John enjoyed Boyd, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and, a, and their book club's done a book which was terrific. What a, it had a twisty finish to it that was outstanding. Which is, which is oh, he's written a lot, and they are all different. Yeah, um, apart from because he, he wrote you know the boy in striped pajamas, and then yeah, he wrote the the sequel, which was an adult book just yeah. a year or so ago. Yeah, no, these were earlier, early, early ones. But yeah. um, oh, he's done all sorts of things. He wrote a th book about it was sort of a western, um, all sorts of stuff. Good writer. So, and there's an so, audience. He's popular. I mean, oh, yeah. people will, will. Yeah, he, he, he's one of our people. Yeah. Mm. No, I think the listener has reviewed re reviewed it very positively. It's called Water. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is an interesting title because. Well, it reminded me of like a, when I saw it, I saw, Tim Winton had a book. That was very had a sort of watery something water in the title, but I suddenly realised well, I haven't we haven't heard from Tim for a while. Any, no. Anything of him on the horizon? Not lately, no. I'll just put this just jacket back on the right way around before I. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it'll be irritating someone. Can they buy this? I've never struck that before. <laughs> right now, I'm going to move into New Zealand books. Yep. Um, First one, just a quick one, um, Tongarua National Park yeah. by um, Desmond Bovey, yeah, an so artist yeah. field guide. Yeah, I bought a copy of that long last month because I just think it's beautiful. Yeah. Well, now I've had a chance to read it. Yeah. Um, outstanding book. Hmm. I mean, the art alone is, is stunning. And hmm. um, given and, and the fact we all drive through you know, National Park or the Desert Road, we, we're all, all Kiwis, are, you know, North mm. Island Kiwis are um, familiar with this. Familiar and, with the landscape, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's now fun to sort of delve into it. And, um, and what an illustrator, whether it be birds or fauna or fish or whatever, um, it is just stunning. And that's what got me. Mm. And um, the little explanations, I mean, uh, this will probably be my best produced Kiwi book, I reckon. <coughs> you know, Sorry. as um, for the production values, just layout, ease mm. of reading. It's it's a it's a real stunner. There, that's got a, this book's got a market. So even though it's around the Tongariro um, <coughs> National Park, it actually any you can take this the thinking of it into any sort of wild part of New Zealand, and mm. you'd you'd get you know. Um, Oh, you learn a lot. Yeah, well, you do learn a lot, but also it is because it is so lovely to look at. Uh, it's a, just the sort of book people like to have, I think. Yeah. No, I, I'm just as I say, as an art book, it stands by itself. Mm. Okay. Now I'm going to jump over to you. Perhaps you've got a New Zealand <laughs> book there. I do. Murray Ball, A Cartoonist's Life by Mason Ball. It's interesting. You know, we had the Barry Crump book written by his son. Um, Murray, apart from being a junior all black and a cartoonist, which is an unusual combination, doesn't happen much, um, he didn't have quite as interesting a life as Barry Crump. Right. <laughs> well, no, well, Barry is a Kiwi icon, and, uh, and Foot Rock Flats is a Kiwi icon, <laughs> but uh, perhaps not the man who... Yeah. Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to get the camera to focus on this. If I talk loud enough, it will. The main re reason I brought this book along is because it's got a picture of my cat in it. Oh, where is he? Uh, it's hard to do. No, keep turning turn that way. Yes, there we go. Around. Yeah, there now is. we've got it. Okay. So yep. that, although he thinks that the cat is called horse, I think it's called griffin. So you, you, he, was, he was given to them, those guys for the photo shoot, you reckon? Or? I think so. <laughs> Well, it's good to have a look-alike cat of a very, you know, horse, the most famous cat in New Zealand. Well, and it was, yeah, and they just you can kind of tell by looking that they've got similar personalities. Both big cats who really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the the foot rot flats. I mean, is it a what's has the sun done him justice? Oh, I think so. 
I mean, what's in the son's story? He's was he a writer before this? No. So this this is a first off for mm -hmm. him. Mm. Just a and readable. I mean, it's yes. you know, it's. I mean, it's it's a it's a terrific story. I mean, a there was the cartoon, then there was the movie, then the kind of the movie spread the music, then the the sort of yep. um, and the whole marketing of the characters uh, into much loved um, yeah. parts of New Zealand's cultural life. And we sort of forget that before Foot Rot Flats, there was Stanley, who um, right, got, you know, he got into the British newspapers and was syndicated. So. And, and selling well? Yep. And got a picture of my cat. That's what you, which you show everybody who picks it up or shows any interest who comes to buy. You go, here's my cat. Let's have a look at that. Yep, absolutely. Let's go to the biggest book on the table. <laughs> the, the Gordon Walters by Francis Pound. Now, I don't know who Gordon Walters is. Now, oh, let me just elucidate you a little bit on, the, on Mr. Walters. Um, I discovered he, he is an ex-student of the school I went to. Oh. Immediately, when I'm talking about Rongatai College here, yes. and having the time I spent there, and subsequently I was there as a teacher, I'd never heard his name once. Um, <laughs> but it goes, there's like, I mean, this is a big coffee table number, yeah. and... Um, and a big price, I imagine that's probably getting up for. Doesn't say there. Um, that's going to be. A and you do get it. It's from the Capity Library. Um, but 1919 to 19. Um, no, that doesn't make sense. No, that's born 1919, and he was went to. But he's out. No, our greatest abstract painter, and. Brian Boyd, who's written some really good books, in his listener article said, when, when people come to New Zealanders, come to New Zealand or talk to New Zealanders about, they say, what, who, tell us about your greatest art, artist. We tend to put McCann up pretty quickly. But they say... Some people might. Yeah, the Europeans <laughs> say, no, no, we want to know, we want to see some Walters. Mm. So it's, for somebody, it's kind of like bigger in Europe and in the art scene rather than over here. Um, this, is, this is an incredible monograph by Francis Pound. I mean, this, is, this book is, the really only interesting thing about this is there's probably never, there's never been an analysis of the creativeness of an artist than this. You know, he has read everything. They were great mates. Oh, okay. Francis Pound and, and Gordon, they, and they constantly, and he was always writing, so he had full access to every bit of, and everything he ever wrote, he looked at it, and everything he ever created, um, he saw, and was all through his life was creating this work. So it's, it's, it's about, for these, there's a, if you want to know about the creative process of making a great New Zealand artist, this is the book. Saying that, it's a real specialist it is. text mm. that um, I think, you know, in art schools they'll study it um, and in the academic world will study it. The general world will probably go to another earlier monograph which was more pictorial and summed it up pretty in a shorter way. Um, but and here's the thing, he destroyed half his work. Because um, he didn't think they were good enough, or got drunk, or perfectionist, mm. and and he didn't get a good treatment in New Zealand. Like for fifteen years, he didn't exhibit. Thought about going to Sydney. Kept working here. Um, they fetch terrific prices in New Zealand now. He, but it is uh, you know if, if it is abstract work, and that's a pretty tough sell. There was a lot of resistance in New Zealand to mm. it, whereas Europe were right into it. Mm. America right into it, not so much here. See, if I was going to publish a book, I don't think I'd have published that one. No, <laughs> I don't know what the market is or what the print run was, but yeah, the market uh, will be small and the print run has to be short, which means the price has to be... I'm, it would probably come in, I reckon, at 90, 100 bucks. It's got to be 100 and something, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's, that's that. Over to you. Okay. Um, work of 
fiction that people might be interested in as a summer read. Bernard Cornwell, this is Sharp's Command. I thought uh, the last Sharp we got, which was a couple of years ago, was set post Waterloo, and he was being some sort of secret agenty person. This is set back in Spain, where um, Wellington was um, trying to chuck the French out of Spain. And, um, yeah. I don't know much about were, it. Were these but, televised as well? I'm sure. Yeah, um, Sean Bean as Sharp. Yeah. Yeah. I know but, people who love that show. I love that show. I've watched it dozens of times. <laughs> <laughs> the hard case thing is, and it, they did it with a cast of maybe 100. So the same guys be in the British uniforms. <laughs> and then... <laughs> put on some French uniforms and shoot back at them. So, you know, and, and when the army was on the march, clearly... We were, they <laughs> but, did the best, yes. Yeah. Nowadays, with a, com with a uh, computer or two, you could have a cast of thousands from... So it's not, it's not Ridley Scott, Napoleon filmmaking, it's, but it's... I still thought they were... I, I just remember back, back in the day, they were still kind of exciting oh, yeah. tales, and, and, yeah. and he was good. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so just and so th there's a loyal readership out there who yeah. will swoop on that. Possibly not that many younger people. Yeah. Most people who started reading them when they were 12 or whatever. They're reprinted now with, with more, you know, attractive covers and... Yeah, they are all still in print. Yeah. Um, That's always a good sign. Yeah. Um, so I say, they're just... All I've done is bring along recent stuff and as many different genres as I can think of. No. There's a good one. Another New Zealand book. The Book Collector by Tony Iyer. Reading and living with literature. Um, really enjoyed this quick read. Um, but I love these books that where they, they sync up with my age. <laughs> so the things that he experienced and the books he read mm. as a kid, I was reading. Um, and the, I mean, he was a, a chartered accountant, and um, but he was a book collector, and um, and probably that would give you the ability to, because they those chartered accountants tend to do well financially, so he, he would have a dollar in his pocket to yes. to to support this. Um, a biblio memoir, how's that for a well, that's an interesting describing term. I think book. it describes what it is. Yeah. Um, Tony, he, he's... So that's a list um, of the books he's read. Yeah, he's mm. a Dunedin book identity. Mm. So um, he's but always been very interested in the creative um, sector of both uh, you know, artists and writers. Um, he's been on boards and the sort of things that were involved in that, that sort of field in Dunedin. Um, it's a, Dunedin is a UNESCO city of literature. Uh, which, I don't know how that happened. Well, they have a writer's walk. Yeah. Which I think is in the Octagon, uh, which I, I was there recently and I didn't find it. And that's just exactly <laughs> the sort of thing I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, I'm going to find it. I'm going back. Um, <laughs> well, that's probably their cunning plan, get you to come back and find the damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is Tony's first book, mm. maybe his only book, but he's written a lot of articles and a lot of professional interest in writing about books but this this little classic little thing here is really good um the his his, his interest is new zealand writers and um and then but also world writers so and he is it's a personal a personal journey of 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 searching and it's a story of going into all the secondhand bookshops of new zealand of which there are photos of them. So there's like, you know, Auntie Bees and the Ferret mm. and Pegasus and all that in Wellington, shops that I'm familiar with, yep. which are mentioned in here. But it goes around the whole of New Zealand. And he would go rambling around these bookshops. Um, he loves going to sort of Rotary and Lions book sales, school fairs, mm. um, you know, second-hand op, op shops that have a little book section, you know. That's where you can get something that might be quite good for a yeah, dollar. Well, <laughs> and and it's, it's kind of like, it gives you as growing up, um, and the story of these of these things, and also the story of covers, mm -hmm. how you collectors get the, you know, like getting 
the you know the the right cover and um, it gets into getting books off the internet um, just how challenging and how what you get and what you don't get and but you can get whatever you want to seem to change ch chase up um, the challenges of COVID um, and it's and he talks also about how do you dispose of your library after collecting all these fabulous things um, you know what do you do with it when you get older. Um, <laughs> But a couple of things like the Brisbane second-hand sale, which is nine days and it has 1.25. It's in the Brisbane Convention Centre, mm -hmm. which I've been to lots of times, never for the book sale. Uh, 1.25 million books and 3,000 volunteers. They would need them just to carry them around. Books when in the mass are somewhat heavy. I know. Well, that the scale of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like in a bookshop that you talked about in New York, which had like 18 miles of, you know, walking to get around the whole thing on the many, many floors of the building in New York. Just might have been 18 miles of shelving. Shelving to yeah, walk. so like, you know, six high or something. No, I think, I think that was the physical walking. No. On all the buildings. Yeah, well, hey, read the book. Um, enjoyable, engaging, a um, lot of information, lots of humour. Um, also, he invites us to reconsider a lot of New Zealand classics, which may have slipped under the radar, um, and and that's the sort of gift it is. I, I think it's um, anybody interested in collecting. And it, but let's go back now. Actually, what I came when I was reading about that. What about the modern day collector? Is there? Do you have buyers who come into your shop who are collecting Bernard Cornwalls or? Oh, you know, yeah. series books. Yeah. I, what struck me, one of the things that struck me very early on was the people who carry around a little notebook. And each page will be, you know, the page per author and the list of the titles and the ones that they haven't got. Yep. And that's how, it, that's how you build up a collection of books out of second-hand bookshops. But also, you know, people will come and say, have you got a copy of... And I say, well, no, because that was published before we opened the shop. But... Still in print, and I can get you one if you want one. So, right. so those people are, um, yeah, really organised. So, so, you know, like, say, say you loved Lee Child, yeah, and the Jack Reaches, and there's twenty, yeah, a few more now, but yeah, seven or whatever. Yeah. There are people who would have all twenty-seven, and they oh, take yeah. and they add them to the. Yep, they come and get the new one every year, which comes out in November. So, what, what, are the, what would you say would be the biggest series that's collectible? I suppose it depends what you mean by collectible, but the ones that I would have thought the one that people would buy every year and get one for Christmas uh, probably is the, the Jack Reaches. Yeah. John Jack Grisham? Do people collect him? Not the same he, way because he's... He, he, he's not a series guy. No, he, no. You know, he well, a short series. Yeah. It's, you know, three of those and four of those, so yeah. it's not quite so critical if you don't get one. But I do get the list. I mean, I mm. just read Slow Horses... You know, by Mike Heron. Yeah. So now I have a bit of paper with the ten books, mm. and it's a slipped slipped into my diary yeah. as my list that I am working my way through, and it is my twenty twenty four thing. Mm. I'm not going to buy them, but I want to read them in order. Yeah. Um, but I'm just fascinated by the fact that you know Tony, and that wants to have them, yes. and he might want multiple editions. And here's another big thing about him: was he knows all the collectors. He knows what they like. He likes finding things that his mates want and then giving them to him. Oh. He's, he, and he's not a... As, he as opposed to ringing them up and saying, you know that book you wanted? I've got the last copy. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Sucks to be you. <laughs> and, it's so, like, he, he, and he wasn't a seller of books. Yeah. He was a buyer and, and a networker because he just, every, he just was into the whole...
is. And you gave me that. And I, yeah. I knocked it down because it's a, it's, a, it's a compulsive idea because, you know, like there's 10 contestants and they've all got a different plan. Yeah. And, you, and you're always looking at it going, would I use that plan? That's the, the how would I do it is mm. the great question. Could I disappear? Mm. Can you? Well, it's not very easy because what, what has turned up in the last week or so is a book called Your Face Belongs to Us, The Secret of Startup Dismantling Your Privacy by Kashmir Hill. And this is about a company called Careview AI, um, which has produced a software which, just by getting a snapshot of your face um, and hooking that into the various databases that are out there, that's it. They know everything about you, where you are. and So the facial recognition software, which... I used to watch a program on the telly called Person of Interest, I think, and you think, that's rubbish. But it's, it, it, it's, this, it's out there. Did I'm, it come out of China, or did it, is it sort of like a worldwide... I mean, they talk about, like, Britain being, or you know, England being it, yeah. the most surveilled, yeah. surveyed country in the world. Well, it's just everywhere now. This, and, and, and all those cameras are, are, are linked. All right. So you, when you see a crime story, you know, reported on the news, you mm. know, a, a shooting and such and such, if they, they get any sense of the, the, the car, they seem to just nail it. You know, next night they're, or next day they're arresting the person. Um, well, we're getting off the subject of books, but... Um, no, but, but that's, that's back into our surveillance. Yeah, yeah. but it occurs to me, you know, people with an electric car, an EV in the not too distant future we're going to have to pay road user charges and then you get into the question of hybrids and how do you charge and the rest of it so the government is now thinking that what they'll do is they'll get everybody to pay road user charges and take most of the motorsport duty away and the way people probably won't get around to buying their road user charges so there'll be a whole bunch of people who are not paying and so what they'll do instead is put some sort of device in your car They'll measure how far you're going and you get charged accordingly and there'll be a direct debit to your bank account. Which means that if the police get access to that, and clearly they would, they yeah. will know exactly where every vehicle is in New Zealand at any given time, whether it's running or going somewhere or where yeah. it's parked up. Or So I don't know what that says, but I don't think it'll be good. Anyway. It, it sounds like a huge amount <coughs> of data. Hmm. Um, but the, and there's a lot of pushback on, on this. You well, know, there should be. You know, people going, um, you know, my life is private. The state shouldn't mm. know. It can know certain things about me, but generally my life is mine. And I don't, you know. Yeah. And it's, but you know what they say, are you really paranoid if they're actually out to get you? <laughs> <laughs> I know. that. Of course that we're all paranoid. We're all full of... But the... It's... Um, these are these are big discussions that I'm. But it's actually the discussion doesn't really. The citizen in the end doesn't seem to have, um, you know, for the greater good of what being protected. We tend to just fold and crumble. Well, we do, um, and I guess you know the pr protagonist and prophet song is. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the the states the states sort of path. Mm. A little bit of a book about the media. Um, how modern media destroys our minds. Right. The uh, uh, School of Life book, of which I am the ultimate fan of, and that they, I would have read a dozen of their books this year. Um, I think they're just the best. Um, calming the, the chaos. Um, beautifully written, full of great illustrations and art to illustrate the points it's making. Um, it's just, it's a, such a good lesson for, and, and, and I don't I think most of us will agree about when we watch TV, how dispiriting it can be, the, watching TV news. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, this gets into it. As, and it's, and it's it, not just what it's what the news is covering, it's the way they do it. Yeah, it's, well, it's the, the internal damage to us inside, mm. you know, of the confusion, the anxiety, the dispiriting nature, the, the sort of, some of it's just downright terrifying, and the dread um, of, you know, is, and this book is like saying, this is not good for us, you know, um, and it makes us, um, 
and it's based on scandal and novelty and envy and self-hatred and um, it's got a high man high minded defense of itself it goes we're giving you we're informing you um, you know and it's sort of self-righteous judgments about what we're seeing yeah um, but the argument is this, this is toxic and uh, it harms us um, and it's but it's a business model and that's that's where you get into interesting discussion about where we've been in New Zealand over the last wee while where you know the business model says it's it's about clicks or you know it very to a very modest degree the, the sale of you know, mastheads of newspapers, physical newspapers, it's mostly about clicks. And that tends to generate a level of discourse which is, you know, not high. So should there be another way of funding the media? Should the taxpayers be doing it? And if the taxpayers would be doing it, does the government get the media to say what it wants? Mm. No, it's a lovely book. Mm. Thoughtful book. Um, it is... It treats this, and it's, it takes it like it's an addiction. And it's mm. like, it, like people get addicted to exercise, and, but they get addicted to news. Um, and they, I'm addicted to news. Yeah, go on. I've got about 10 or a dozen news sites I look at probably twice a day. Yeah, and it's um, the cures. It gives us some cures. It goes like, hey, this is not the whole world we're seeing. And maybe that's why you're, when you're looking at lots of platforms, you're trying to get a bigger picture. Mm. Um, it doesn't reflect what our own community life. It's, um, it, we we are too hopeful. We need more useful pessimism. But you know the um, and it sort of argues we need to be like an aristocrat of the spirit. We need to be a little above this stuff and being able to push it away and not feed the addiction. Um, develop other interests. The news is not good for you. Um, no, the, it's probably uh, not. But it's it's got a lot of interesting philosophical ideas, and it's um, you know for the for the, for the thoughtful reader, it's it's a it's a welcome sort of engaging, easily accessed into the debate with lots of insights. The problem is the the creation of echo chambers, isn't it? That because you can create a media outlet for modest amounts of money these days. Um, and then you, the way you build it up is to attract people who agree with you. And once you've got a number of them, the only thing that people find, the news is just the news that they agreed with and it's been fed to them because people knew that that's what they would think. And, you know, yeah. it's very hard to... The, um, the other book from the School of Life, which... Um, Elaine de Breton's a therapeutic a therapeutic journey mm. lessons from and where he draws from a lot of the various books and puts it into one um, one beautiful package. Um, I loved it, terrific. I mean, it's got a lot of the role of of kind of art here. I've kind of to hear it. Look at it. It's um, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with this. You're familiar with it, and he had one another one. An emotional education, I think. Mm. Um, the actually, what does it say? The what are the two paragraphs on the top of the? It well, it says, <laughs> this is a book about getting unwell, about losing direction and hope, about imagining that we've let ourselves and everybody down. So he's not exactly overselling <laughs> it, but it's also a book about getting better, about regaining the thread, rediscovering meaning, and finding a way back to connection and joy. Yeah. I, I, I just cannot speak about it highly enough. Mm. Um, full of understanding and, and sort of kindness, practical. The use of art is just um, stunning. Um, it's full of ideas. No matter, we all may think we're pretty healthy mentally and all that sort of stuff. This just just gets us more. I, I read these books. I, I feel I know myself better, which is always a sign of a good book. Mm. Um, you know, whether it be fiction or non-fiction, um, highly commended. But that, that brings us where we to the big part of the show, Steve. <laughs> the part where we we look back and make some calls on what really moved and us, we, the books we love, the books, in your case, you probably encourage 
your customers to read or the mm. ones you talk about when people, when you're sitting and having a glass of wine or a coffee and talking books, the ones that come up. Now, let's begin with non-fiction. Any non-fiction books that kind of come across that you'd like to think about? Um, well, the one I like, which no one else seems to be keen on because they haven't managed to sell it in is conflict. That's a General Petraeus one about the history of warfare since World War II and where he thinks it's going. Um, I've seen that on bestseller lists. Mm. That, that's, got, that's got overseas traction. It is, that's been a book of interest to a lot of people. Mm. Well, the, I mean, the war in Gaza is not really a war. That's a kind of a, an unpleasantness. Um, but the war in Ukraine is a, that's an old fashioned war being fought with technology which even even eighteen months ago was unimaginable. Uh, well, which has a, rendered a whole bunch of extraordinarily expensive hardware completely pointless. <laughs> so yeah, yeah I'm the, But it is still in the trenches, but it seems like the the trenches move every night and, and the, the every it's a fluid sort of Yeah and But the, it seems flat when you watch it on T V. It's Ukraine kind of flat. Yeah. yeah. Flat with rivers, yeah, and trees. The odd tree. So, I had, yeah, mm -hmm. I had books that got me. Um, Waiter in Paris, mm. Edward Chisholm. I was a big, big fan of that. I thought that was stunning. Um, Patty Smith had a book out called Book of Days, where she took a photo of each one, photo each day, mm. and all that. Um, I'm a Patty Smith fan and loved that. I'm not sure if it was published this year. It might have been out. I th 2022 maybe. My, but my recollection is it's a little bit older than that. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. Still, it's still it's still a book that I, well I read this year, mm. Poverty in America by Matthew um, Desmond, and thought that was that was just terrific. Mm. Um, really gave me an insight. And and the Wager by David Gann, mm. um, which when I summed them all up. Um, the Wager, actually, I thought was my probably non-fiction book of the year. Because he's the... Flowers of the, the Killer of the Flowers. Flowers of the Killer Moon, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, yeah. And this one came after that, also yes. has been optioned as a film by Scorsese and DiCaprio. Mm. Um, so I, in a couple of years we might see, and, and what a terrifically dramatic story it is. It would mm. make a great movie, but in the hands of those guys. Um, Someone I came, actually came and asked me for a copy of that today, and we didn't have one, oh, despite your earnest recommendation. Yeah, no, it's um, it, it, that was that was my non-fiction one. Let's jump the fence onto the over to the, the fiction side of it. Um, let's begin. Favorite New Zealand book this year? Fiction. Well, again, I'm not 100 percent sure it's this year, but. Um, the X-Men's Carnival, I think, certainly that's the one we've sold the most. Um, and that won the Ockham. Yeah. So it got, a, it got a big boost from that, obviously. Yeah. What about I think in time, that will be one of our books, one of the New Zealand books. Pet? Um, well, that's much more, much newer. Um, doesn't seem to have... Got the imagination like no. the... Yeah. No, well, the magpie just drew us in. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it's funny and hard and yeah. sort of clever. The um, I I like Burnham Wood, by Catton, which I know is wasn't everybody's favourite um, book. Pick me. Yeah, but and, and especially you. But <laughs> um, I liked it. I thought it had bits in it that were terrific and. Um, yeah, yeah, we agree smart. on why you like it, because there's a whole bunch of left-wingers sitting around cafes <laughs> talking endlessly. <laughs> exactly. My people were in it. and um, But um, and my other one, you know, Monty Souter's Kawai, yeah. um, I liked it. And I'm, I liked it enough that I, I'm looking forward to the, you know, he's promised us three. Yeah. And um, I, I think he's laid the groundwork, so um, mm. that's, that could be really good. What about international thriller books? Well, there's a lot. Um, I mean, 
Uh, let me let me kick this around first. Mm. I mean, I'm I'm coming up with the age of vice, um, which I'm not sure if we, whether even we took talked about on the show. We may have, because I really loved it when I read it, which mm. is a Mumbai Indian gang yeah. setting. I, um, by I, I suppose that it is, but I wouldn't. Yeah, deep. But that 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 gang tale. It was yeah. an international, um, Kapoor. I I loved it. I thought that was. Never been to India, mm, but once again, I, I was sort of there, mm. and um, it's 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 a big story. But I thought just super duper, um, you know. So that was that. And police procedurals. Um, we our best selling crime writer is Anne Cleves. Um, <coughs> that was a new one of the the summer is that. Um, Matthew Venn ones. Right. Can't quite recall the title. Um, they being televised? Do they 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 get optioned up and? Uh, I'm sure they will, uh, <laughs> because they've made um, they've done the Vera's and the um, and the Shetland series. Yeah. So, which were great. Yeah. My police procedural was um, was a New Zealand one, and it was um, better than. Um, Better the Blood by Michael Bennett, I think that mm, the what title right. was. Yeah. I read it earlier in the year. Uh, also made the shortlist, which was kind of interesting for a a, a little police story. But it was an Auckland tale, mm. and um, you know, Utu revenge. You know, a, a killer sort of working on old an old photo, slowly taking out um, descendants, mm. and the chase, the pursuit by the police for them. Um, Really good, really good Kiwi, um, pacey police procedure would work really nicely. Legal thrillers. Um, Prima Facie, that's new, so that's... The, I saw that. Yeah. I saw it at the screening room mm. as a play yes. from the National Theatre. Mm. They, they film plays, mm. and I trotted up... One person, a woman, um, in, in a legal, on a stage, or, you know, filmed, um, would I imagine make a terrific book. The play was superb. Yeah, and it's written, you know, by a woman or a barrister who'd made a career out of defending people and realised that maybe some of these men that she'd been getting off shouldn't have got off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and well, in the in the case of somebody in her own history, mm. when she ends up as a prosecutor, suddenly there's somebody in front of her that she's got a history with, which she decides not to declare and take him there. I mean, what a setup! Now that that is really good. I re I like to, and I do like kind of these when I look at you know legal thrillers, um, the big courtroom scene mm. one, and, and mine one was. Um, Central Park West by James Comey, who was the FBI, head of FBI, and then um, taken out by Trump and then turned novelist and, and wrote this one. What a guy who knew the court system. Mm. And, and he got a really good case going where it was a, there was a federal case and a, a, dear, a district attorney type case, a local case with connections. And um, he really got an insight into American law. And we, we see these courtroom things when we watch Trump going in and out of various courts um, this book takes us right into this into the crimes of um, of New York mm. and um, and there is a great crime in it that's got no explanation um, and you know how the lawyers handle it and and who shares information with what with who that's just about our list actually but going back my Literally, my big kind of book was probably that I really did enjoy and was, hasn't really been reviewed all that well was Be Mine by, by Richard Ford. And it was his final book, um, sort of slipped under the radar in a little way. I see he's returning to the festival in February. Um, he'll be at the embassy. So you're going to take him canoeing again? Well, I, I, will, <coughs> I will probably um, meet my mate and we'll go there and see if he remembers us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you, the trouble is, on those events, there's no way you can get near them. Yeah. Absolutely not going to happen. Um, yeah. Now, have we done everything? No, we've got a little bit over there. What have we got left? Well, these are just a couple of other new things. Um, I'm not sure what I think about this. 
so this is Wonka, which is a new book. I've, I've seen the, the trailer on, yeah. on, the, on the TV show. Yeah. So, so it's based on the screenplay. It says here, inspired by Roald Dahl, but it's not written by Roald Dahl. <laughs> yeah, so you take a character and, and people are playing already with the... Uh, yeah. Because we, we had Johnny Depp mm. and we had... Gene Wilder. Gene Wilder. Mm. And now we have young Timothy... Chalamet, I think. Chalamet, the Dune boy. The Dune guy, yeah. Um, so if someone said to me something... Cause you get offered little you know, books about you know, bloody Taylor Swift and there was one about... And Timothy says, Chalamet, and I said... Who? <laughs> but now I know he was very good in June, and, yeah. he, and um, so this is this is the young Willy Wonka, isn't it? Yeah. So. But at the TV reviewer Rogers on our television news thing mm. loved it. Mm. Said this was a terrific movie. Um, but we're a book operation here, so it's whether the book of the screenplay is going to have the legs. Well, that's right. And I haven't tried to read it. We've only had it. Well, you, need a, you need a good teenager to come in. Um, we need a teenage reviewer. Some, uh, some. It'll be a girl because the guys, the young men, aren't really going to get into this. You know, they, they don't read enough. Mm. Whereas, you know, someone who ne- some do. I'm sure there are, but we should actually think about that. Having you know, like somebody who's keep because neither of us read into that field, but we do need a little like mm. that's a classic book that needs a, a young adult to tell us about it. Yeah. So, as I say, these are just, I tried to bring something along from every genre, if you like, we've had for a little while, but not long. Um, so Wonka, that's a sort of what we call early teen. And I also thought this is worth mentioning. Um, this is Ruby Tui, Little Ruby and Friends, um, because her the Ruby Tui book was a, the big sleeper from last year when the when the ladies won the World Cup and Ruby's book was out there and everybody said, and I have a copy of the Ruby Tui book and all I had to say, well... I read it. That's no. a good book. Yeah. And this, I think, is in a similar sort of idea, really. This is about... It's about kids helping each other. A bit of teamwork. Good story. It's got little Ruby in it. Um, and your buddy's just... I don't... I don't think every kid's book has to be about making the kids worry about the planet burning, you know. <laughs> they're, allowed, <laughs> they're allowed to be four for a little while. Yeah. No, so I quite like these sorts of things which are, you know, not, not preachy but quite good and where kids can recognise themselves. So it's, that's yeah. little Ruby and friends. Yeah, I keep an eye out for that. Well, Steve, that actually brings us to the end of the year. Um I have enjoyed the whole process. How mm. many? How many? Uh, twelve. Twelve. I think we've done them all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, episodes. We've looked at an awful lot of books. Um, that, if you want to track, you can find them on the uh, Elmo's Bookshop Facebook page. Mm. Um, and, but the best way is probably just to rock up into Elmo's and um, have a chat to Steve, who is, um, as always. Sitting there waiting, <laughs> waiting to communicate with you. Um, so, look, from the both of us, um, we're wishing you all the best in the new year and we look forward to catching up with you in the end of January. So, I hope you and Gail have a happy Christmas. We will. We will. We're looking forward to it and uh, I've got a big stack of books to get through, mm. so I'm very happy. <laughs>